use to influence how they vote or what bills they would lobby for. Uh, it's a free country. Even though the Constitution says there should be no religious test for public office, that means on the side of the government. The government can't keep somebody out because of the wrong religion or give them preference because they're the right religion. But when it comes to the other side, the religious freedom, Christians and Jews and other believers are free. They're welcome to vote their conscience and try to influence the government from the private in the democracy. But um, an establishment of religion doesn't deal with private expression or private views. It deals with the government itself speaking. And that's what a lot of religious people don't grasp, the difference between free speech and government speech. Free speech is protected. Government speech is restricted. And that's, what's, that's a big d distinction. In fact, before any of the freedoms are spelled out in the First Amendment, you know, um, freedom of religion and speech and assembly and mm -hmm. freedom of the press and to petition the government, those freedoms of conscience, before those five freedoms are spelled out explicitly, there's a non-freedom or there's a, a restriction that's put in place first, not on the people, but a restriction put on the government. Mm -hmm. So the very first words of the very First Amendment, the Constitution say, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. So the government's hands are tied. The government is bounded by what it can or can't do, which then allows our freedoms to flourish because the government is staying neutral. The government can't do anything respecting an establishment. And that establishment clause uh, in subsequent court decisions and by further amendments, the 14th Amendment, for example, uh, makes sure that the... First Amendment applies not just to Congress, but to all the states. It applies everywhere. And, um, and you said earlier that this is good for religion, and this is one particular uh, aspect of the First Amendment, because we have 36,000 sects of Christianity. We probably wouldn't have that many if it was like, the, for instance, the Church of England in the 16, 1700s, when there was an official one religion, officially only one religion, correct? Yeah. Well, look what happened in Europe. Um, they have a state church over there. And now, I, I guess it's like the marketplace of ideas. Once, once it became a monopoly, there was no competition. And religion atrophied. Most people in Europe are secular now. Mm -hmm. The church doesn't have to try. It doesn't have to hustle. It's getting paid by taxes. So you have these beautiful, gorgeous, empty churches over there that are a throwback to when there was a theocracy. So in our country, in the United States of America, it's the opposite. We don't have a state church, which means that on every other street corner in town here, you've got churches competing with each other and the free marketplace. Come to my church. No, come to my church. Here's what we have to offer. No, here's what we have to offer. It's like a big PR thing. All these churches are trying to attract. And that's actually good for religion. The government is backed off. The government is saying, you guys use your own powers of persuasion, you argue amongst yourself. And one of the things the foundation says a lot is, in the United States, we have complete freedom to disagree and to argue about religious differences. But one freedom we don't have is the freedom to ask our government to settle the argument. We can't go to daddy and say, who's right? Who's right, him or me? We can't do that in this country. The government has to like say, hey kids, yeah, I'm out of this. You've, you've settled it yourself. you figured it out yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's what the separation of state and church means, that we have total freedom among ourselves, which is amazing, total free thought. And like Ann Gaylor has always been saying, um, you can't have religious freedom if you don't have the freedom to dissent from religion. Mm -hmm. If there's no freedom to dissent, what's the freedom? So millions of Americans dissent either from the established or major religions uh, and become cults, let's say, like Jehovah's Witnesses and such, or millions of us dissent from religion altogether, and we are atheists, agnostics, secularists, mm -hmm. or just this huge kind of blob of Americans who are, they call themselves non-religious. Non-theists. Yeah, non-theists, but even beyond that, there's non-religious, mm -hmm. that people might actually have some kind of spiritual beliefs, but they're not religious. They don't go along with any established, you know, they You're might have about the new age type of uh, yeah. spiritualism? Or even people who might actually believe in a God of some sort, but they don't care to define it, and they certainly don't want to be religious. They just mm -hmm. are not religious. But um, the, the polls are kind of different, but they 
sort of average out to about um, 9 or 10 percent of Americans are thoroughly secular. But about 16 percent of Americans would be considered non-religious. So there is a chunk in that group of non-religious who, who wouldn't call themselves atheists, but they're just non-religious. Mm -hmm. And what you can say about those people is that even though they might have some religious views, you could call them practical atheists. They don't go to church. They don't pray. They don't give money to religious organizations. They don't do any religious rituals. In their day-to-day -day life, they, they're no different from a secular atheistic person. Mm -hmm. So they probably, we probably agree on most of the social issues, and our lifestyles are pretty much mm -hmm. secular. So. Well, that's practical atheists. I haven't heard of that before. I, because uh, if you ask anybody if there's an atheist, if they're an atheist in the U.S., chances are only two to three percent will actually say they're atheists. But all of the the rest of them that are non-practicing, practical atheists might say, "Well, I'm not an atheist, but I don't have a religion or go to church or pray." Yeah. But there's a growing. Uh, last year, about this time, uh, February of 2009, there was a Pew study, and uh, it was it was determined that uh, it was discovered that there are more non-theists or more agnostics people who are selecting the nun box in the re religious affiliation uh, checkbox uh, in America, and mostly between the 19 and 29-year-olds. What brought that out? Yeah, between college age and 20-somethings, mm -hmm. yeah. That whole demographic is the least religious we've ever had. And part of that's the Internet, because you can't hide on the Internet. Religion mm -hmm. can't play the same games that it used to. You can look things up. Part of it is the history and the culture of our, of our nation's past. Whatever it was that happened in Europe, it wasn't due to any organized atheism. There, you know, atheists didn't sail over and start preaching atheism to the Europeans, so then they all said, oh golly, we should give up our religion. It just happened organically. In Europe, the people just pretty much saw their past. I was in Dublin two or three years ago to debate Richard Swinburne. I went to University College, and afterwards I was talking with some of the college students there. Mm -hmm. and. They're like, what, 18, 19, 20, you know, that age. Mm -hmm. And they said they were embarrassed at their country's history, that they would like to catch up with the rest of Europe and not be seen as this backward religious country. They said, we are not our parents' generation. And a number of them volunteered that the scandals in the Catholic Church with the pedophilia has lowered the credibility of the church so much that a lot of people are saying, enough. They might have been pretending to go along. They might have answered surveys and said, oh, yes, I'm Catholic. But now they're less likely to want to answer the surveys and say, I'm Catholic. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, in surveys, when it comes to issues that are considered socially desirable, people tend to over-report. Church attendance is over-reported. So even in the United States, we can bet that a lot of people who put down Christian are probably not. A good chunk of them are probably just putting it out because my mom and dad are Presbyterian, so... So I'm Christian. You know, a lot of people are like that. So there's no way to know. There's no way to actually tally it. We do know that church attendance is about doubled. The report of church attendance is double of what it actually is in the pews. Mm. Historically, for the last 30, 40, 50 years, about 40% of Americans report that they regularly go to church. And that's held pretty steady. Uh, but people were wondering about that. If that's true, then why is it when the population is increasing, church attendance is going down? Why is that? And it turns out when they actually go in and count the people who show up weekly at churches, it's about 19% who are actually there. Mm. But people tell pollsters, oh, yeah, I go to church regularly, which is what they think they should be doing or what they think they should be saying. But in actuality, on any given non-holiday weekend, Four out of five Americans are not in church. It's only about 20% who actually go regularly to church. So. Well, that also depends on the area. I imagine that in a southern Bible Belt area, Evangelic uh, Baptist, for instance, might be a little bit more uh, attended, uh, attending yeah, maybe, uh, church but, services. But down there, their, their reporting would probably be higher as well. Mm -hmm. They would probably, re maybe 60% would report that mm -hmm. they go, but only 30% are showing up. So you're probably right. This, the one specific survey they did about 15 years ago was in Ashtabula County, Ohio, which um, isn't a liberal county, it, but it, uh, they, they actually found every church, every place of worship. They went to every single place, and they got either self-reported or they went in and counted people, and they came up with about 19%, even though the My week goodness. before they had done a phone survey 
scientific survey where 40% said they regularly go, only about half of them. So people tend to exaggerate their religiosity and their church attendance. And well, let's talk a little bit about sociology now because uh, both of us know Phil, um, Phil Zuckerman. 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 Zuckerman, yes, Zuckerman. And 